Um, thank you for the introduction and, and, and thank you very much for inviting me to be part of your uh, seminar series. Um, it's always great to have an opportunity to share some of the, the work we've been doing in my group at the University of Winnipeg. And also to, to share some of the ideas uh, that we are currently thinking about and, and, and working on as, as um, um, hopefully it'll, it'll generate some discussion and, and we'll get some feedback about that. Um, so let me share the screen here. Uh, for some years now, we have been working, can you see it? Is that, is this okay? Yes. Okay. So from some years now, we have been working on a, a form of reproductive isolation between species that is hybrid male sterility. And we've been using uh, approaches to to see, uh, so in, in, these are species when you cross them, the females are fertile, but the hybrid males are sterile. And we have been using gene expression approaches to try to identify uh, genes that are misregulated um, in the sterile hybrid condition. We have used closely related species because of two reasons. First, we think it gives us a better glimpse into the early stages of divergence of these lineages and the other one is that these subspecies, they're not really fully formed species, but they're what we call subspecies. Um, um, these are produce only um, sterohybrid males in one direction of the cross. And that gives us um, fertile hybrids that we can use um, to subtract in a way. So we can identify genes that are um, specifically misregulated in the, steril, in the sterile condition. And using this type of approaches like transcriptomics, we have, we have identified, uh, for example, uh, enrichment of certain gene ontologies like um, proteases in, in, in relation to hybrid male sterility, also to certain extent cell addition genes. And more recently, we have identified that some of them might be putative targets of an already known hybrid male sterility protein. And we're a bit of an impasse with that because uh, one of the challenges, because these are not the pure model, Drosophila melanogasteris, to, is to have the gene toolkit so that we can um, do gene perturbation assays uh, to study gene function more directly. So today I'm not going to be talking about that. I'm going to be referring to proteases at some point, but I thought I'd bring it up so that also in case someone wants to chat about that later on. Instead, what I'm going to be talking about is. Um, some work we have done in a different group of reproductive genes. These are seminal fluid proteins that the male transfer to the female during copulation and that they list the series of postmating responses. And we have done work on their, their mode of evolution. And now we're following up with trying to um, uh, figure out what, what might be the role of regulation of those genes in the establishment of, or misregulation of those genes in the establishment of reproductive isolation barriers. So the, the the talk today has basically uh, three main th themes that I'm going to go through. Uh, I would like to start by stating that I think it's a well-established observation by now that reproductive traits and genes on average show um, a pattern of rapid evolution, in particular rapid divergence between species. And because of that observation, the, the question that followed is what drives that divergence, whether selection has been an engine that has driven that rapid evolution. And for that, I'm gonna show you some results that we have already produced and published about the evolution of, um, of the coding portion of the gene for these seminal fluid proteins. And then I'm gonna move into some work we're starting to do in, on the regulation and, and the divergence in expression of these seminal fluid proteins. And central to all this will be the question, the central question for us is whether the rapid evolution of these genes is contributed to the, to the, in some way to the reproductive isolation between the species. So a question basically about the, the genetic basis of speciation. So for reproductive traits, um, these are just a very few pictures for the vast but, uh, immense amount of literature on the topic. Uh, but I like to show, these are pictures I have taken. I took this one a few years ago of a male picker at, at the local zoo. And I like to show this one because if you have taken an introductory biology course uh, or an introductory evolution biology course, you've been, I'm sure, exposed to an image like this that is used to illustrate the concept of sexual selection. That is, these are secondary sexual traits that the male uses to display and attract females to mate with him. 
But this elaborate ornament imposes a cost, if you want, in terms of uh, survival. Uh, so these, these um, complex uh, ornaments are favored by sexual selection. And this is to rapid evolution of these traits and sexual dimorphism. So if you think of Drosophila, if you're a Drosophila person, a trait, uh, this would be the, the male sex comb in the flies. Uh, we know also that the um, that, that also the primary genitalia uh, or primary sexual traits also evolve very rapidly. And so, for example, if you work, uh, these pictures of course come from me, and they're biased towards Drosophila. Um, but in Drosophila, the way we I, I did this hand drawing of the posterior lobe of the genital arch of four closer related species of Drosophila, Drosophila simulans, Mauritiana, Cecilia, and Melanogaster. And if you look at these flies, you cannot tell them apart as what species they belong to. You have to put them under the skull, push their abdomen, and look at the, at the uh, posterior lobe of the genital arch to tell them apart. So the genital uh, evolved rapidly. This is true also, for example, in, in, in spiders, it's tremendous amount of diversity in insects in general. And it goes also for the internal um, um, reproductive traits. These are pictures of different species of their testes that they are very different in length and coloration. You have some species with short testes and with very long testes, and all the way down to the sperm cells, which have been referred to as the most diverse cell type um, in animals. So here you see some sperm, some very short sperm, some long ones. And what I have done in this uh, graph is basically rank species of Drosophila based on the length of the sperm. These are species that differ in body size between three to six millimeter. So you have flies or species that can have sperms that are up to 10 times the size of their body. So sexual selection, uh, precopulatory sexual selection can drive rapid evolution of uh, these secondary sexual traits that confer an advantage in terms of competition and choice so that a male is a better competitor is chosen by females. And that's an advantage because then be able to fertilize their eggs and that will translate in progeny. If this form of sexual selection is directional between species so it leads to different adaptations, you can have rapid evolution between species of these secondary sexual traits. We know now, we have known for many years now that uh, really even if a male is a better competitor or chosen by the female, females usually mate with more than one male and that creates a hidden arena uh, for competition between the ejaculates and, and you know, cryptic choice by the female that leads to differential fertilization of the eggs and different amount of progeny, progeny being produced. And um, it is believed that the rapid evolution of, of uh, sperm size driven by this form of post-copulatory sexual selection, but also the male, there are some molecules here that are quite interesting. And these are proteins that are transferred by the, are produced by the accessory glands in the male reproductive tract of Drosophila. This is drawn by one of my former students and they are transferred to the female during um, uh, copulation as part of the ejaculate. And they are very important in terms of the, the female postmating physiology and also innating the sperm in, in its, uh, inside the, uh, for storage and for fertilization. We know that from a large number of studies that have been done in which the, these genes are perturbed and the function of that, what, what that perturbation does is analyzes, look at. And by perturbation, I mean things like knocking out the gene, which will be equivalent if you're in a room with a, a switch, like you can turn it off, that would be a knockout. They also sometimes knock down something, which would be like if you have a dimmer in your light, you can lower intensity. And then you ask what happens um, to the male. And we know that these um, accessory gland uh, secretions can affect the ability of the sperm to be stored the retention of the sperm in storage, the release from storage, which is important for fertilization. It can also affect the post-mating uh, behavior of the female. They, for example, they become reluctant to remate. Some of them contribute to the formation of mating plant, which is a form of coagulum that blocks other, can block other sperm from entering into storage. And this is true in Drosophila, but also in a, in a wide variety of, of organisms. And it's important to make this uh, or to highlight this, I'm going to come back to that, this later, that um, most of these studies have been done in single making assays. But clearly you have a, a, post, a role in post-making physio uh, physiology. 
what do we know about the evolution of seminal fluid proteins and of reproductive genes in general? So it was mentioned that I did a PhD with Rama Singh and, and Rama really, his lab uh, pioneered the study of the evolution of reproductive traits that goes back to the eighties, early nineties. I was part of that during my time as grad student in the nineties. And what we did is was we will extract proteins from, from different tissues uh, and separate using two dimensional gel electrophoresis. These are two gels I produced in those days. Um, and uh, we will compare, we will ask how, what proportion of proteins are unique to the species. And what we found is that um, proteins of the meropratic tract um, have a higher proportion of, of them are unique to the species. So they, they evolve faster than other proteins. Of course, this tells you that they evolve fast, but it doesn't tell you anything of what's driving that rapid divergence. So with with advances in the 90s in sequencing technologies, you can think of the automatic sequencing in those days or, or, and also the creation of databases, people are starting to do this type of studies where, including myself, where, where you align sequences of these protein coding genes. And you ask, you can not only quantify the number of differences, you can qualify them. You can say, well, some of these changes do not affect the amino acid composition of the protein, so they're neutral, they're synonymous changes, but some are affecting the amino acid composition. And so the beauty of this is it gives you a, a null hypothesis of neutrality, where if the, if the gene is evolving under neutrality, you expect that the proportion of synonymous changes will be equal to the proportion of non-synonymous changes. But if the amino acid substitution is not synonymous changes, if they are deleterious, there will be uh, um, selected gains or will be under negative selection and you will expect a lower proportion of non-synonymous changes than synonymous. And if these amino acid changes are favored because of different adaptations in different species, you will, you will expect to have a higher proportion of non-synonymous to synonymous changes as evidence of positive selection. And one of the earliest and nicest examples about uh, rapid evolution driven by positive selection is the um, Avalon sperm uh, surface lysine protein uh, which shows a very um, high ratio of non synonymous substitutions between these, these species and their external fertilizers. So it's believed that um, the selective pressure here is adaptations to, the, to um, proper recognition of uh, sperm and eggs in the external environment. You can, of course, partition this. Um, there are follow ups to the study, which is, for example, to partition the analysis into different domains of the gene. Uh, we have done this for um, ADAM proteins uh, in, in mammals. Uh, some of the ADAM genes are sperm surface genes, so we were particularly interested in those and comparing to ADAM's genes that are non-reproductive genes. And ADAM stands for a metalloprotease at the syntegrin domain. So these are genes that span quite a length of the, in the genome. And so you can partition your analysis of the proportion of non synonymous anonymous changes to ask what's happening in the proteolytic domain and the metalloprotease domain, what happens in the adhesive domain of the protein, which is the disintegrin cysteine rich domain. And what we have found is that there is evidence of positive selection in the addition domain of the protein, uh, both in rodents and primates, and that seems to be driven by adaptations to proper um, male female recognition in different species. And of course, you can go even farther and ask whether there is evidence of selection and specific codons if you analyze the evolution of the genes in the, in the in a phylogenetic context. What we have found for seminal fluid proteins is that they are more divergent among species of Drosophila than other proteins. This is really, I'm showing you Drosophila is true for other species as well. So this is a figure from a, a paper we published um, back in 2007. That was a, a result of a collaboration between uh, Mariana Wolfner Lab, with Mariana Wolfner Lab, Cornell and Brahma Singh and McMaster and what we did is calculate the, the proportion of non-synonymous to synonymous substitutions for genes expressing the testes, the ovary, testes and ovaries, and so on. And what we found is that seminal fluid proteins have the higher ratio of non-synonymous to synonymous substitution across, in comparison across species, and that that's driven by an acceleration in the proportion of non-synonymous changes. So, let me go back a little bit about um, seminal fluid proteins function and the rapid evolution. So from gene perturbation, the vast majority of gene perturbation assays that are done are done in, in single mating uh, situations where female, you perturb the gene and you ask what happened when you made that male to a female. 
and clearly they affect postcopulatory fitness. Now, the function of that gene in, um, can be preserved by negative selection. So even though uh, a protein might be changing a lot, if the function of the, of the protein is still preserved regardless of the, of the changes, um, that could be a, an example of negative selection because the function is still preserved across different species. Of course, it could be driven by positive selection, that is different adaptations in different uh, species. Um, but that, that direction of formal selection could be natural selection because some of these genes have uh, roles that are important for, for example, fecundity. If, if knocking down the, the, um, uh, this particular seminal fluid protein that affects sperm storage, that definitely will affect the fecundity of the males. And so that could be driven by natural selection. But this, you know, in general, we tend to think that if, uh, if because they're rapidly divergent um, and because of their po functioning postcopulatory fitness, the rapid evolution must be driven by postcopulatory forms of sexual selection, right? But postcopulatory sexual selection requires competition and choice, those types of situations. And, and that requires that, so one way the males compete and the females have opportunity for choice is when females multiply mate. So what we did some years ago with uh, my um, collaborator, Jose Ranz at UC Irvine, was to comb the literature for, and we published this in 2019 uh, as a review article uh, called Genetic Factors Influencing Sperm Competition. So what we were interested in, in, in combing the literature, not only for Drosophila, but for other species, and asked how many studies have really, you know, done uh, assays in which you knock out, for example, seminal fluid protein on a gene in general, uh, it could, doesn't have to be a similar fluid protein gene, but um, you knock it out and ask, how does that knockout affect its ability to be to compete against another male or to be chosen by the female for fertilization? And if really the gene has an effect, what you will expect is that now this male that has orange eyes would, would father less progeny than in this control situation where the gene is not knockout. So we look for uh, assays or studies that have done gene perturbation with knockout knockdowns or null the mutants. And together with um, the testing of the effect in competitive paternity situations, in some cases we look at association studies of SNPs. And actually, ideally you wanna have both. You're gonna have evidence that variation in the gene, natural segregating variation affect the, the, the competitiveness of the male uh, and also have the laboratory manipulation of the gene. So I think it's important to, to really ideally have both. In some cases, you can do also uh, some of these studies did sperm track is tracking so that when a little bit further with the phenotyping. And in general, I mean, the take home message of the studies that there are really very few studies that have done this and that we really need more, um, more of this type of analysis. Uh, but if you ask about seminal fluid proteins, about a third of them um, uh, have been analyzed. And uh, you can read this in different ways. You might say, well, the studies are probably biased towards this type of proteins. True, or you can also use it as ammunition to say, um, maybe seminal fluid proteins do have an important role in postcopulatory sexual selection. I keep moving this bar around, but hopefully it's not on the way. Um, so sperm competition is a form of postcopulatory sexual selection, right? Because you have, males competing against each other and females having options for choice. And the way we measure that in the lab is by, by mating a female to at least two males in succession and then asking if this is our experimental male, the blue one, asking uh, what is the proportion of progeny that that male is fathering, either when it's first or second to male. And what we have found from studies in Drosophila is that when you compete, when you set up these studies with flies all of the same species, you see a pattern of second male advantage, that is the last male to male fathers the majority of progeny. But between species, there is a breakdown, there, is, um, there, there has been clearly divergence in, in, uh, in the sperm competition uh, phenotype in that, um, in the form of what we refer to as kind of specific sperm precedence. That is, if you've made a female to males, one male of the same species and a male of a different species, regardless of the order of mating, the majority of progeny is fathered by the last, by the male that is conspecific to the female. So in this example, will be the blue, the blue male that is 
assuming the female is blue species. So this is a form of reproductive isolation. So reproductive as a post-mating presigotic isolation barrier to reproduction. So restrictions to gene flow could happen pre-mating in the form of divergence in behavior, for example. They can be post-mating post-zygotic, like examples I go told you about at the very beginning about having male sterility that we're still very interested in pursuing. Uh, but this is a form of post-mating pre-zygotic. So it happens after the mating, but before the formation of the zygotes. And what, you, what happens is that the male that is kind of specific to the female, regardless of the order of mating, manages to father the majority of progeny. Now, because of the role of seminal proteins in post-mating uh, fitness, uh, physiology, this is, it's, it makes sense to speculate that seminal fluid proteins might be important contributors to these, uh, to this um, form of uh, reproductive isolation. So, a specific sperm present is a diverged phenotype, and that makes it amenable to, to mapping and to identify genes that might drive that divergence. And so, the question we're asking is whether rapidly evolving seminal fluid proteins drive uh, different adaptations between species, and also whether these the same seminal fluid proteins that mediate um, competition, that is that they are driven or that are important for, uh, in terms of post-copulatory sexual selection, are also the genes that when they, they diverge, they lead to the, to, the, to the occurrence of reproductive isolation barriers in the form of kind of specific sperm presence. And that's an important uh, question that goes to the point of whether sexual selection can drive the establishment as a consequence of sexual selection, have, you can have the um, and the formation of reproductive isolation barriers. So just to summarize a little bit, um, I have told you that seminal fluid proteins um, show faster divergence between species than other protein genes. They clearly have functions that can affect post-mating fitness. And the question is, is the rapid divergence of seminal fluid protein driven by selection, selection towards different adaptations, and thus seminal fluid protein diversion contributes to reproductive isolation. And that's something we're very interested in pursuing. So before I go into the results of that study we did on the, on the rapid evolution of seminal fluid proteins, I need to go a little bit about rapid molecular evolution and, and selection and what are the expectations. And of course, the first situation here, negative selection that I sort of like toned down here in gray, because it does not drip, of course, to rapid evolution, it doesn't lead to rapid evolution. So negative selection removes the deleterious mutation and as a consequence of that, you have low, low divergence between species and also low polymorphism. Positive selection is, favors different adaptations to become fixed in, in different species, and that leads to uh, high divergence, but also low polymorphism because as these mutations happen, uh, they, they get fixed uh, in different species. But high divergence can also be driven by relaxation of selective constraints. So if those mutations that arise are not so deleterious so that the, the uh, negative selection becomes relaxed, that allows for the accumulation of, of mutations and for rapid divergence between species, but also for a lot of polymorphism within species. Now, <laughs> reproductive genes, um, if you ask how strong selection needs to be to drive divergence between species for reproductive genes, they truly face a challenge, and, and that can be, um, or at least I can, point out are three challenges that they face uh, if you ask in terms of how strong selection needs to be. Uh, one is that many of these genes are sex bias and expression and that limited the effectiveness of selection because it reduces the effective population size, right? So how effective selection is depends on the effective population size. And now if you have genes that are expressed only in the male, for example, that really um, lowers um, um, potentially lower the impact that selection can have. If the genes are sexually antagonistic, that means if they, they are advantageous for the male, but they, they, they come at a cost to the females, they're gonna be selected against by, by, by the female side. And, and then that means that the net directional selection is even weaker as, as, as than in set, set specific uh, situations. And in sperm competitions, we know that selection is also weakened as a function of the number of mates per female. So given that, and we, uh, and also let me point out um, one other point, that most of the study, not all of them, but a large number of them that have studied the adapted, the look for patterns of adaptive diversification in reproductive genes, including myself, 
and seminal fluid proteins in particular have done that by comparing divergence across the species and asking what proportion of changes are you know, non-synonymous to synonymous. And one limitation of that is that if you're not looking at polymorphisms, you can, see, you can have situations like this one here where you might think the one, one change here is a fixed substitution between species when the reality might be a shared polymorphism. So I think it's important that we analyze divergence, but also include information about polymorphism and that can be assay for selection in tests like the McDonald Kramen test, which is effectively a two by two uh, Fisher exact test in which you classify changes as synonymous, non synonymous, and you ask what proportion are fixed between species and what proportion are polymorphic. And you have a nice neutral, um, a, a nice null hypothesis, which is neutral evolution, and under which you expect that the proportion of fixed non synonymous to synonymous changes between species will be equal to the proportion of non synonymous to synonymous changes within a species. That is that the evolution of genes is driven by accumulation of mutations. So, um, a couple, so we thought a couple of things motivated us to embark in this study. So we thought that we needed um, studies of the molecular evolution of seminal fluid proteins that uh, include a large number of uh, sequences and we needed to, to look at a lot of proteins and I said a couple of things motivated us. There was a, a review article in Trends in Genetic by Dapper and, and Wade that really, a really nice article that uh, brings inside the idea that perhaps the rapid evolution of, of these reproductive genes, um, prolapse selection has been more important than previously thought. Um, but this study looks at a few examples here and there, the review one. We thought, let's, let's look after, let's go after a lot of proteins and let's include a large number of, of individual sequence from different populations and see what happens. And let's focus on proteins that, that have an effect on post-copulatory fitness, like seminal fluid proteins. Um, the other thing is my postdoc at the time, Bahar Patlar was very much interested in was working on seminal fluid proteins and we were in the middle of a lockdown. So she, she was interested also in gaining experience in, in molecular population sequence uh, analysis and molecular evolution. And uh, this, you know, the time was perfect for that. And uh, Jose Ranz, my collaborator, has has seen that paper I'm talking about interest in genetics, and actually he came out with sort of like, should we do something about this? And this is an interesting paper. And so he became part of the of the study, and he brought along Vivek, who helped with some of the analysis. We published this this work uh, um, last year in Evolution. But so what we, what we used as a starting point was a, an article by Stuart Whitby in which he identifies 292 seminal fluid proteins as proteins that are transferred by the male to the female in population. And to that, we added some other uh, proteins that are expressed in the accessory gland, uh, highly expressed in the accessory gland, but they're not transferred because we wanted to, to compare the mode of evolution of transfer versus non transfer proteins. We went into um, a database that, it's a collection of sequences from different populations of Drosophila melanogaster. And we choose these two populations, ancestral African Zambia population and a derived North American Raleigh population. Um, they have, as you can see from the circles, the larger number of sequence individuals and also the better quality. And for this, uh, we did the, the workflow was uh, basically to estimate divergence for these similar fluid proteins and compare to the rest of the genome so that we can classify them as either evolving faster than the genome average or slower than the genome average. We then uh, run McDonald's Kramen test to look for deviation of neutrality. And we also examine polymorphisms for two reasons. As I mentioned before, under positive and negative selection, you expect low polymorphism. Under relaxation of selection and also under situations of se sexual conflict, you, spend, you expect higher polymorphism. And also you expect different results in terms of distribution of polymorphism and for example, in situation of relaxed versus conflict, sexual conflict. So what did we find? Um, well, first we, we found the expected pattern that uh, seminal fluid proteins evolve show a faster divergence uh, between species than the genome average, and that they show a higher proportion of non-synonymous and also high proportion of synonymous changes in a higher ratio than, than the genome average. Um, for the, for the semi-afflow proteins, we found that if you look at them, um, if you 
separate on to which ones do, yeah, on average they go faster, but which ones show faster um, uh, ratio of non synonymous to synonymous substitution than the genome average. So they evolve, they have high divergence versus lower divergence. We found, depending on the population that we look at, about 60% of genes showing high divergence. And this high divergence, as I told you before, can be driven by forms of positive selection, but also could be driven by relaxation of selective pressure. Interestingly, a, a large proportion of them do not evolve at ratios that are higher than the genome average. So they are lower in the rate of evolution. When we apply McDonald's crime and test, uh, some of these show um, significant deviations from uh, neutrality in the direction or significant um, results in the direction of positive selection. That is a higher proportion of non-synonymous substitution than non-synonymous polymorphisms. And on top, they had low polymorphisms, and that's what you expect under a situation of positive selection. There were about 7 to 12 percent of them. Non so not, we really want, to be honest, we wanted to think we were going to find a, a really high proportion of them. And we were sort of like a little bit shocked by the fact that there were not a lot of them under positive selection. For, for the other ones, um, so we have seven to 12% under positive selection. It was actually a, a relatively large number of them that, that were, um, that had high divergence and high polymorphism, and, and they were not rejecting, they, they were not rejecting uh, McDonald's crime interest in the direction of positive selection. Um, and this is the kind of, picture you expect uh, under relaxation of selective constraint. So high diversion, high polymorphism. When we look at the distribution of polymorphism, we saw an enrichment for rare alleles, which is what you expect under re re um, relaxation of selection under situations of conflict, you, you will expect uh, more alleles in intermediate uh, frequencies or more of balanced polymorphisms. For some of the slow evolving, actually one of them is actually, uh, even though it's evolving slower, it's under um, positive selection, uh, but the rest were all uh, showing low um, uh, polymorphism and low diversion, which is what you will expect under situations of selective constraint. The, the significance here of the alpha means basically you probably have a, a few slightly deleterious mutations that then don't get fixed segregating and that uh, produces significant McDonald's climate test. We did a few other things. I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but just to, to point out a few that we found some, some interesting things. Um, we were interested on, on how the biological process and genome properties might influence the mode of evolution of these genes. So whether they are relaxed, positively selected or, 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 um, or under constraints. And so in terms of biological process and function, we found that uh, non-tissue specific seminal fluid proteins are primarily under selective constraint. And so are seminal fluid proteins that are older, that is for which we can find orthologs in very distant species. We think that these are probably seminal fluid proteins that are uh, that perform some kind of housekeeping uh, important reproductive function and therefore are selectively constrained. And they're also pleiotropic, right? So they are not only specific to the reproductive tissue, but they might have roles in other tissues. We also found, and that's why I mentioned proteases and before, uh, even though for the obscura subspecies that we studied, the, the, what we were looking is difference in expression. Here we're looking at coding sequence, but we found an excess of possibly selective proteases, which we think is interesting, not only in the context of what we have found for uh, regulation of expression and enrichment in mis, uh, misregulated proteases in a hybrid, but also several studies have looked at the uh, uh, several of these seminal fluid protein being um, having proteolytic activity and that being important for post-mating fit fitness. And we found an enrichment of positive selected genes in the X chromosome, which we think probably has to do with the mysagosity of the X chromosome so that um, recessive beneficial mutations are readily um, uh, driven there by, by positive selection. <laughs> Important question here, how we, how we underestimated the proportion of positive selected genes. Uh, certainly that's a possibility. And, and one, one possible reason that might have led us to um, underestimate is the lack of stringency to the, to the take departure from the null, given that some of these genes can be very short. And so basically it's an issue of sample size. And what we did to try to, to address this was to do iterative removal of the shorter genes from the pool and reanalyzing the proportions. And we found no differences between mode of evolution. 
even after removing the, the shorter genes, we still saw a, a higher proportion of, of these proteins under relaxed selection. The other are that maybe perhaps selection is localized, like the example I show you about Hadam proteins, or actually that, that was inspired really by the earliest examples of that are immune system genes, like the major histocompatibility complex proteins in which selection is localized in the antigen rec recognition sequence of the protein. Um, from a personal point of view, I, I think, and this is, this is um, arguable, arguably, um, of course, it can be argued against, but um, these are short genes. So I think that if there is positive selection, probably you'll have huge high effects that will, will drive integrity of the protein. But regardless of that, you could, you could think that maybe it's localized to domains. And the one challenge we face is that there are not really known domains in this seminar for the proteins. We could, we could, of course, partition the analysis to, by doing some kind of slide window, but that would be sort of arbitrary approach. You can also use phylogenetic approaches, like I showed you before, and ask, well, the specific columns are under positive selection here. Um, that requires, in order to detect these signals, you require that there is repeated, repeated positive selection over time or a, 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 across the history of the evolution, evolution history of the gene. Um, if the bouts of selections are localized to specific lineages, you probably would miss it. But more importantly, you have to remember that we are not interested in what in the in selection in the context of the evolutionary history of the gene, but rather in early stages of differentiate of differentiation. So in, in pairwise comparison among closely related species. What about non-coding sequences? Right? So what about sequences difference in, in regions upstream of the gene that might uh, contain um, regulatory sequences or regulatory elements? So the way to think about this is that uh, you can have divergence in cis regulatory elements upstream of the gene, even though trans regulatory elements are conserved. The reason to think this way is that we know that in divergence between species, um, is in regulation is primarily driven by divergence in cis regulatory elements. And so it's possible that this divergence might, might affect the way the transregulatory elements uh, interact with this element so that you might have in one species the gene producing low number of transcripts and in the other producing high number of transcripts. And that this different expression might be what is important for the, for the divergence and the function of these genes. So we actually did a, a last summer, um, we started looking at that with a group of undergrad students at um, uh, using a modified version of the McDonald Kremen test, looking at upstream regions um, uh, of these genes and focusing on the Zambia population. Uh, we did over Zoom, we we're still quite a bit under a lockdown with three undergrad students. And we find actually, uh, this is preliminary, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of positive selection in these uh, upstream regions. Of course, this only include uh, promoter and promoter proximal elements. And of course, the regulation can be very complex. It could be, for example, driven by distant enhancers. So the fact that we don't find anything there doesn't mean that there might be divergence in other regulatory elements. So what drives the phenotypic evolution? So as I told you before, um, specific sperm presence basically is the result of divergence in sperm competition between species so that conspecific males father the majority of the, the progeny. So if this phenotype is driven by selection, um, right selection on the phenotype and by product reproductive isolation. If this uh, if you think of a genetic basis with some genes the, and the, the effect is additive, the, the effect of selection is partitioned over the genes and so it's weakened that way in certain ways. But you know, it is possible that a few major coding genes under positive selection drive divergence, right? Um, you know, we, they, they started with it on the molecular evolution, molecular population genetic of seminal fluid proteins. It really uh, serves to illustrate that we should be a little bit more careful about assumptions that the, the evolution, the rapid evolution of these genes is necessarily driven by directional forms of selection and that we need proper null hypothesis and the proper null hypothesis maybe will be to really reject the uh, neutrality. But, but that doesn't mean that, you know, that doesn't mean that maybe a few of these genes under positive selection might drive the diversion. The other possibility is that uh, 
because the majority of the genome is non-coding, that there might be more uh, of these major genes or might be more of a role of, of non-coding regulatory elements in driving the divergence and adaptations, um, uh, different adaptations in the, dif in the different species. That's what something we're interested in on now, and it's some of the preliminary things I wanna show you about. Uh, and we have, of course, evidence of uh, regulatory evolution and driving different phenotypes. The earliest example I can think of is this paper by King and Wilson that goes back to 1975, in which they, they basically look at protein divergence between human chimpanzees and found very limited divergence. Yet, pro yet chimpanzees and humans are anatomically very different. They also behave very differently. And so they say, we suggest that the evolutionary changes in anatomy and way of life are more often based on changes in, in the mechanisms controlling the expression of genes than on sequence changes in proteins, right? And that's basically what we're thinking here, that perhaps um, changes in regulation might be, even though proteins could change a lot, but that doesn't affect the fitness and really is, the, is how much protein or how much transcript you made that would be affecting the phenotype. Moving forward, of course, we have many examples and more recent examples of phenotypes that are, are driven by, the versions in phenotypes is driven by um, regulatory uh, changes, adaptive regulatory changes. Well, one of the most, uh, one I would like to bring up here relates to one of the examples I show you, which is the Drosophila genital morphology. Some really nice work done by Hagen and collaborators. A couple of papers I'm highlighting the other one in PNAS, but there is another one more recent in MBE. And basically this look, they look at the morphology of the male genitalia, which evolves rapidly. So it's very different between even Simons and Morishana, which have diverged only 250,000 years ago. They particularly focus on the claspers that are structures that have essential roles in grasping and securing uh, coupling. And what they find is, you know, there, there have been some studies that look at the genetic basis, but they really go into detail of trying to find genes that mediate these divergence in phenotype across species. And what they found is they found a really a major gene um, that has caused evolutionary changes between the species called tartan. When they look at the gene between Simons and Morishana, there are no fixed amino acid changes between the two. The difference are in the expression during the developing of the genitalia. So this is a really nice example of all the potentially important role of difference in regulation in, in driving this phenotypic diversification. So given that, then the prediction we have now is that if selection drives diversions in the expression of similar fluid proteins between species, um, so that, that changes in expression is really what underlines the changes in phenotypes and what contributes to conspecific kind of sperm precedent, for example. So you can think of a similar fluid protein that is in high more highly expressing melanogaster, and that high expression is what make melanogaster able to completely or almost completely are compete simulants with specific males. So if that's the case, if we zap that gene so that we bring down that expression to levels that are similar, or at least closer to simulants, um, the question is whether that makes this, the, these males now behave more as simulants males, right? Um, and less competitive against that simulant male. So what genes are we going after? So, um, what are our candidate genes? So we originally thought that maybe there'll be some genes that will show no expression whatsoever in the male reproductive tract of simulan and in the accessory gland of simulans, even though they are expressing the accessory gland of melanogaster. Maybe they are expressing a different tissue and simulans or completely new genes in melanogaster. And we thought maybe a little bit naively that uh, some of these genes that lack orthology, clear orthology in, in simulans, according to Flybase, it might be, you can find the, or the sequences in simulants that are similar to the melanogaster and they are perfectly, look perfectly fine, but we thought maybe they are not expressed in the simulants reproductive tract. Um, they're usually lost in you know, transcriptomic assays because they are not annotated in the genome. And we thought maybe this is a good group because they are the ultimate extreme difference in expression, right? Like non in simulants expression in melanogaster. We also came across a, a recent nice transcriptomic study that looks at accessory gland, but also other tissues by Mahane and collaborator using single nuclear nucleus transcriptomics. And uh, they, they use the, they do this study to identify the novel genes, um, but we, we pull out their data and, and did an um, analysis of expression. And we found 
47 candidate genes of the 292 transfer seminal fluid proteins that show higher expression in melanogastrin stimulants. Remember, we're interested in higher expression because what we're gonna do is use the toolkits of melanogaster to, to knock down the expression. Of course, we could potentially look at the other ones by upregulating melanogaster expression. What do we find about the 20? I told you naively we thought, the reason is that only one of the 20 show what we expected. So this shows that the, the primers are efficient in terms, uh, they, they work efficiently. And when you look at expression in the meroproductive tract, the gene uh, is expressed in melanogaster. These are primer dimers, uh, but there is no expression in, in simulants. So not quite what we expected. There are three others that the primers are, show efficient, proper efficiency and higher expression in melanogaster and similar. So those are still interesting to us. Um, interesting, four out of the 20, when we, the primers work well, but when we look at expression in the reproductive tract, we, we saw none and we thought first, well, there are some issues maybe with our primers amplifying from RNA instructions. But when we look at the transcriptomic data, these genes are all genes that have very low expression in the accessory glands. So they, they have, is an, on average, uh, two transcripts per million. So it's actually nice because it sort of validates our assay. And, and so definitely these genes are very lowly expressed. And the remaining are genes that either show no difference. Some of them, we of course have primary issues like this one here. You have poor efficiency in simulants, of course, because of the poor efficiency, you see low expression in, in simulant, but it's not real, it's not real. It's one other that might have, we're not sure, might have high expression in melanogaster. But regardless, we have four genes from this assay plus the 47 candidates from the transcriptomics. Now, we can go after all of them. Uh, there's a lot of genes to, to, to go through, but we thought maybe we can prioritize some of these genes. And one way to prioritize, we thought, is to look at the, the known function of them, some of them, uh, and by looking at gene ontology, and also trying to identify that perhaps there might be networks of these genes interactions that might be particularly crucial for the function of these genes. And when we did this and throw on the, in the network analysis, we throw, we throw they are differentially expressed genes and also possibly selected genes. We identify a major network that actually includes a lot of genes with um, gene ontologies that relate to post physiology, like sperm storage, sperm competition itself, insemination, regulation of female receptivity. Four of them are also member of the sex peptide network. So sex peptide is a, a seminal fluid protein that has been studied quite a lot. It, when transferred to the females, it makes females reluctant to remain. It also aids the, the sperm to enter storage and to be released from storage. But for that requires the help of at least eight other proteins uh, that form what is known as the sex peptide network. And four of those proteins are in, in our group here of differentially expressed genes um, that interact with others. The X refers to possibly the genes that actually, by the way, these ones are not differentially expressed. We see very, no, not a lot of overlap. And one of them is a gene that is known to have some role in the formation of the mating plant. So these are clearly genes that we, we could prioritize in an assays. And what we're planning to do is, oh, actually one other thing is one that rang a bell when I was, this, this network that I was doing them last week, one of them, the, the name rang a bell and it's because we have done in the past studies of uh, sperm competition, um, the role of sperm genes and sperm competition. This started with the use of introgression lines to between Simulans and Marishana to map genes, sperm genes that might contribute to conspecific sperm present. And we highlighted two loci out of those mapping studies. And then we started looking at um, the, the 89B region of the third chromosome seemed to be enriched for genes. Uh, that my candidate genes, and we started looking at those in melanogaster using RNAi uh, or knockdowns. And uh, one that keeps coming is this one, MST89B. Uh, our most recent study where we knocked down the expression in a testis specific, uh, specifically in the testes, what we found is if you knock down the expression, it severely affects the, the second male paternity success of the male. Not because the males are unable to transfer sperm they transfer sperm 30 minutes after copulation, you, you find good number of sperm. But one hour after copulation, there's a depletion of the number of sperm from storage. And it doesn't translate in this sperm um, fertilizing more eggs. Why is disappearing? We don't know. But nevertheless, there seems to be some role in storage and proper uh, uh, um, effective fertilization or effective usage of the sperm. 
And actually, MST 89B interacts with ACP 62F. I have sort of like noticed that in a paper we published in 2010. So it sort of like rang a bell. So it, it, this is a nice connection to some of the sperm genes here that we have been studying for the role, at least in the sperm competition. Let me tell you that we have already assayed some of these genes. So for example, this one here, we know that also that from a recent study we did that it has a role in intraspecific sperm competition. So we have started in some of the assays, at least in intraspecific sperm competition. We know that some of these ones, some other, not the one, not only the ones highlighted here by colors, also have a role in intraspecific sperm competition. So what we're gonna do, I'm not gonna go into detail through this one is just describe the technology, it's basically doing knockdowns using the GAL4 system in Drosophila that allows us to trigger RNAi. Of course, we're gonna make sure that the knockdown is effective. And then we're gonna do phenotyping. And uh, for that, the plan is to test interspecific sperm competition by competing these new mutants. Again, uh, uh, controlled males that had green fluorescent eyes. You can see them here under the scope. And so if the gene, the knockdown of the gene, if the gene is important for interspecific sperm competition, when you knock down, you will expect that this competitability will decrease. So you have more flies with green eyes in the progeny, as opposed to the wild type control. And we have already tested, as I said, you told you before, some of these genes in interspecific settings. And then we plan to test these genes in conspecific sperm present. We're ready to do that. It took a little bit more time. We have a marker for that. It's not uh, green eyes, but it's curly wings. And the idea is the same, uh, whether these, the knocking down of the gene will result now in the, in the first that their specific male being more competitive against this uh, melanogaster male compared to controls. So what we expect is that the differences in expression between the species are driven by different uh, directional sexual selection, the gene perturbation should affect both interspecific sperm competition because the gene has a role in postcopulatory sexual selection in one form of postcopulatory sexual selection, which is a sperm competition, and it's leading to that divergence leading to the establishment of reproductive isolation barrier. The finding that there is a common genetic basis would be quite interesting in terms of uh, giving ammunition to the idea that maybe sexual selection can drive speciation. It is really important that these genes are genes that are differentially expressed between species, right? Because you can knock down or knock out some of these similar fluid proteins and find that they affect both interspecific and conspecific sperm precedence, but maybe they are not diverge, for example, in expression. So the fact that they knock down uh, causes phenotype both within and between species because maybe that gene is preserved it has a very important function, both uh, preserved by selection, by purifying selection, both within and uh, but, uh, across the species, basically. If difference in expressions between species is driven by relaxation of selective strain, we expect that these knockdowns will have no effect on any of the phenotypes, or that perhaps the gene perturbation could affect one or the other, which will be quite interesting because it will give us a comparative pool of genes that do not have a common genetic basis between intraspecific sperm competition and, and conspecific sperm presence. So in summary, um, to summarize, uh, genes that influence reproductive fitness do evolve fast and on average, this is a well-established uh, pattern over the years. It's important that I think the point to make is that rapid gene evolution is not evidence of positive selection. I think there is a tendency to assume that if reproductive genes, and I'd be a sinner there, if reproductive genes evolve fast, it must be that the fast evolution is driven by uh, uh, directional forms of selection and particular postcopulatory sexual selection. And really we need more phenotypic assays and we need proper testing of deviation from the null hypothesis. And we have the tools now to do that by including polymorphism data. Uh, but how the question, how do we reconcile phenotypic diversion with genes evolution? Uh, I think that can be done in two ways. It's possible that a few possible selective coding genes drive phenotypic divergence. It's also, and this is what we are, and we're interested in, is to sort of like compare to how changes in gene expression, or to what level changes in gene expression play a role in the phenotypic divergence. And whether that diversion is also a basis for the, the evolution of reproductive isolation, the occurrence of reproductive isolation barriers. Clearly there is a need, as I keep uh, saying and repeating myself, for for assays that combine gene targeting, uh, that is the perturbation of the gene in the context of segregation, but segregating variation, that is in the constant uh, context of 
of understanding that these, when you look at variation across different species or, or within population, that there is actually natural segregating variation and two phenotypic acids. An example I use in my courses is that when we think about a cancer and you can knock out a, a, a gene and it contributes to the onset of cancer, that doesn't necessarily mean that that gene is a gene that um, contributes to onset of, uh, of cancer in natural population, right? You can knock out a lot of genes and cause phenotypes that are not really, but those are not really genes that for which natural variation or segregating variation in the population are contributing, contributing to the condition. So with that, I'd like to um, stop and, and thank you for the, your attention. I would like to really uh, thank my, the Natural Science and Engineering Research Council of Canada who has funded my research for 22 years now. Uh, but Harpa Clark was a postdoc in my lab that did a, a lot of the work on the seminar flow protein evolution. And she's now actually next month, she will be moving and starting her own group in, in Germany at uh, Martin Luther University. Uh, so we're very excited about that. Uh, Carolina is a new grad student who has just uh, started in the lab and is taking upon the work, of, the work on expression. Clara, Nate, and Emmett are those three undergrad students. I show you, Nate is coming back to the lab. And of course, my longtime collaborator, Jose Ranz from UC Irvine, Vivek, that collaborated in that is the study of um, the evolution of coding evolution of seminal fluid proteins. And Rob Kulathina from Temple University, um, we, we engaged Rob in some of our preliminary discussions about the, the molecular evolution of seminal fluid proteins. And he was instrumental in pointing to us some of the, the resources and also sharing some of the data that he had. So thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'll be happy to, to answer or to address some questions.